My name is Oli Rohameki. I'm from MFA Finland. I have a question uh, slash uh, a comment slash question to David. Uh, I have worked for years and years in and on Afghanistan, and uh, I really liked uh, your discussion about the legitimacy trap because it speaks quite well to the situation there. I mean, despite the billions and billions of <clears throat> dollars and euros uh, into Afghanistan. It's not the the place is falling apart essentially, but I mean it's not about the lack of investment in infra, in clinics and schools and what have you. It is about the lack of accountability and particularly uh, legitimacy in terms of justice, and that's that's exactly the point because the Taliban are gaining ground because their way of thinking and, and justice resonates. It's based on Sharia and and and. and local customary law and it uh, resonates <coughs> with uh, with the population at least in parts of, of the place so um, can you maybe elaborate a bit more on this sort of uh, yeah legitimacy legitimacy trap and particularly the the issues around justice issues if you have researched on that file thanks thank you um, my name is Liz I work for DFID um, and I'm an economist so naturally I'm going to ask about data can you comment on how new innovative data collection um, or generation methods are opening up opportunities for research in fragile states? Um, and what data sources have you found the most useful in your research? And in your opinion, where's the sort of most promising um, future supply of data coming from for these questions? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to, to all three speakers for sharing your work with us. I had a question uh, for, for you, David, um, more of a suggestion than a question. So it struck me as you were presenting some of your results that you had quite a high level of heterogeneity in your findings. And it occurred to me that this is a very valuable exercise to find out what are the determinants of fragility and how do certain countries escape them. But it, I wondered whether there was possibly heterogeneity within each of the types that you were looking at. So instead of attempting a grand theory, uh, look for some middle range theory that there may in fact be multiple reasons, perhaps you've already thought about this, multiple reasons why some countries uh, do escape from the fragility trap and others do not within that category. And similarly, why some countries stay stuck, uh, their reasons may be different within that category as well. Thanks, I'm Johanny Koponen from the University of Helsinki. And I must say that I have some doubts about the analytical value of the whole concept and category of fragile, fragile states and fragility. I understand that they are, they are useful concepts for donors who want to know which are those places that are dangerous or that are getting dangerous to us, not, not only to themselves, but also to, to us, which are going to cause, to cause problems. So, so where do you have to, to put some more, some more effort and resources in? But as we have seen even in this, this session, I think we have disagreements which, which, which other countries can, can be considered as, as fragile. And above all, I think they are, they are very different. They are very different you know, among themselves. Uh, and as, uh, although I'm not quite sure, I, I, I did get the point about this political settlement framework, which that, that, what is so, so particularly radically new, new in it, because it's about power relations anyway. And, um, but certainly, certainly I, I think it's a valid argument that aid is something which brings in, which, which brings in resources, which, 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 you know, which you call rents, and which then, then are accessed differently by, by different actors, both elite actors and, 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 you know, and other actors in those countries. But my, my question is that, what is the point of pouring aid in countries where government, which, which always acts some part of the aid, is rather part of the problem than part of the solution. I mean countries like South Sudan, Eritrea, and of course Afghanistan. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Mekri, I'm from Safer Globe. I actually have a question to Jussi Oyala. This Somalia example is, of course, really, really interesting. Um, at the same time, having development actors working in conjunction with the government is sort of stepping on the toes of crisis management and potentially other UN actors, which are also focused on developing government structures. Um, 
I would like to ask you where you think the special benefits were in this kind of collaboration, or was it just that you had this uh, window of opportunity to act here? So I have a question, um, especially for Helena, but maybe David also wants to comment. I think there's an, an interesting conversation um, between your two presentations on Mozambique and Angola and your interpretation. Are you interpreting the cases the same way? Would you agree with what David is, is finding in his categorization? Uh, what's your reaction to his, his interpretation? Um, on the question of Afghanistan, as you know, the uh, special uh, inv investigator of the United States has gone in and drawn the same conclusion that you have. And it's actually a quite stunning result when you consider the amount of money that's been allocated just by the United States alone, that they are now uh, recognizing that their efforts to bring some long-term stability to this country have, for the better lack of a word, failed. Uh, and that the Taliban now controls more territory now than, than ever before uh, since the, uh, the so-called global war on terror began 17, almost 17 years ago. So when your largest aid donor is coming to the same conclusion that the rest of us have known for some time, I think there's, it's a sobering and it's also uh, unfortunate that we have a government in the case of the United States that seems to uh, want to re-engage that country with a small, lightly armed military capability rather than rethink the problem. If you ask me personally why the mission there has not succeeded, I think in large part it's a function of our inability to get a regional solution in place, recognize that Iran, Pakistan, and even Russia and the neighboring Central Asian satellite states are all important to finding a lasting solution to Afghanistan, in particular Pakistan's obvious willingness to provide safe haven uh, for the better part of the entire time that the West was occupying Afghanistan the Taliban were free to go where they wished and this was rather sad in that this goes to my core point about the failure to engage Pakistan and Yemen uh, in ways that would have actually been meaningful to resurrect uh, or re re redirect these countries away from fragility. In the case of Yemen, you have a situation where the dialogue with Yemen was the global war on terror. Initially reluctant to engage in that alliance with the United States and paid the price. Uh, as we know, many foreign fighters returned uh, with the incursion of the United States into Afghanistan, Afghanistan back into, into, uh, into uh, Yemen as well as from Iraq. And then Saleh saw the light and decided, yes, I will dialogue with the United States on the global war on terror. Uh, this, while well, he was sent, essentially providing safe haven to the Al-Qaeda al operatives in, in his own cabinet. So one has to appreciate the regional dimensions before coming to any conclusion about Afghanistan. In the case of legitimacy, it's a sad reality that a government that is considered more legitimate in the eyes of the people is the one that we consider to be our opponent or our adversary. Uh, many ridiculed the idea of mediating with the Taliban 10 years ago in 2008 prior to the surge, but that per perhaps precisely what needed to be done. Many laugh still that the idea of Iran being an, an essential partner in finding a regional solution to Afghanistan, largely because of the low, larger global machinations at play here. So I, I think, you know, long-term solution for Afghanistan rests partly with our own assessment of the, the realities are as uncomfortable as they may be. With respect to legitimacy, this is a, uh, runs across all cases, whether they are in the trap or not. And I would encourage you to re review our working paper on the wider website where we unpack that a little bit, a little bit more. The core thing is whether or not the Taliban can deliver on service delivery. All the things that are obviously important to the population will matter. Education being one of them uh, in ways that may not make us feel comfortable. But core things will ultimately determine the success of the uh, leadership there. A government that chooses to rule solely through coercion cannot last in perpetuity. Uh, there has to be some kind of abiding social contract that you, we give you and we take, but you also take and we give. Uh, and there has to be that agreement, and let's see how that plays out. And the question of data, we collect our own data, but I think it goes to the bigger question that was asked just after that. Um, uh, actually, no, it was the fourth question on whether fr fragility is a conceptually useful tool. 
I would reverse that question and say, what is the evidence showing us? We, we could call them banana countries. We could call them anything you want. We don't have to use the word fragility. But list after list that is showing uh, database after database that is comprising information on the SDGs, if, if you want, are showing the same thing. Now, there are variations, but they're showing that there are a certain number of countries, despite the amount of aid that, are, that is being given to them, are not moving out. So regardless of whether you find the idea of fragility conceptually useful, it's a reality that there are countries that are on the receiving end of aid and are not absorbing or allocating it more, more uh, uh, as in a way that was intended. More problematically, I think, in the case of many of these countries, they are speaking the dialogue or the language of the aid community without affecting change. This is the... Uh, the problem of isomorphic mimicry. When I read that quote from the last presentation, I thought that he would, the next uh, sentence in that quote was, you're being played or you're being fooled by the, by the, uh, the city state or the, uh, the central national apparatus, that there are things going on at the local level that the, that the, uh, the center doesn't want you to know about or they're at odds with with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the dialogue that is going at the local or regional level. Because essentially that's where aid is distributed. And there are brokers, donor aid brokers, if you will, at the local level who use aid money in the way that was not intended. And it's basically that was a message to the aid community, stay out. Or, you know, there's, there, so there, there, is a, there is an issue here that you need to figure out. You can't ignore it. Country after country is showing up on this list. So on to the question of data, yes, I mean, we can pull on different data. I would, I would personally go at a more local level. I would pull at data that is not uh, pan-national, but rather sub-regional. And I would draw on uh, more uh, individual survey data as well as household survey data. But this, you know, frankly, this is a discussion we had 10 years ago. So, and DFID was a, uh, one of the leaders in this, in this uh, dialogue. So. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and look at the crisis states research that DFID funded through the London School of Economics, uh, which was in place for, I don't know, five, six years, maybe longer, uh, for all the data collection that was done by them. So on the conceptual de definition issue, we could spend a lot of time deciding which countries should be on that list, but when we, when we draw the conclusion that there are certain countries that are always appearing on a variety of different lists, we've got an empirical issue here. Uh, regardless of whether you agree with uh, fragility or not. Ones that are not necessarily poor. Ones that are middle-income countries. Ones that are not necessarily driven by conflict. Uh, ones that have gotten over conflict but remain mired. So let's, let's look at that <coughs> evidence and then talk about why we think that commonality exists, which leads me to Omar's obviously very difficult question. Because he basically say, why did we do something different? And I think methodologically he's right. We should have compared within cases. And there are obviously nuances and differences within cases. Uh, our desire here was to determine whether there were the commonalities, uh, perhaps not from a stringent methodological perspective, were robust enough that we could draw some conclusions about why types of states experience exit or stay trapped. Um, I, I agree on entire, entirely that those commonalities are often stretched a bit, uh, and one has to make the case, especially in those that have uh, moved in and out. I would believe I believe there's consensus and within our results on why states stay trapped and why they have exited. But on the in and out cases, like a Mali or a Laos, draw a slightly different conclusion. And uh, we'll probably also focus on the question on data, which is kind of like one of my favorite issues. And <laughs> to my mind, this opens a number of, um, of interesting questions and links again to the differences in the type of work what, that we do. And it's ultimately also a methodological question and, and a question that is um, uh, contingent upon the type of research questions that we are uh, pursuing. And I spouse uh, and make part of a tradition that uh, uses historically grounded comparative political economy, uh, whereas uh, I think most of the participants in uh, the seminar and in the conference 
um, are more comfortable and use uh, to a greater extent large data sets and correlation analysis. Uh, and, and that obviously kind of like, you know, leads to very different questions and very different interpretations. So as, as uh, David was saying, well, there's simply things that are so much reiterated in the data and in the comparative uh, analysis that clearly point to uh, uh, issues that uh, demand uh, some sort of explanation. Um, and I would, we won't have time for this, but I would kind of like revert the question back to David in terms of, um, perhaps I didn't quite get it in your presentation, but it'd be really interesting to, uh, if you could tell us a bit more, how is it that these proxies of uh, fragility are constructed? Because it is in how do we measure that fragility that some of the discrepancies in the way we explain these clusters uh, or grouping some in, in, of countries um, um, may reside. And, um, and yeah, I think you sort of like touched on it, but uh, certain proxies are clearly not um, uh, subtle enough to pick up, um, as he said, uh, inter-regional and uh, sub-regional differences, growth and poverty. Uh, when we, uh, it's also an issue of the unit of analysis. Most of us doing, uh, you know, speaking about countries, whereas uh, we know that these polities are so fragmented and where things work very, very differently at different sub-regional levels. Um, so that also being the case. And I will take the provocation of, um, uh, Rachel's provocation on why is it that we uh, seem to have come, be, be coming to a different understanding of um, Mozambique in that, con in that contrast with Angola. And I would say here that there's a number of uh, things that explain why we're coming to a different interpretation. On the one hand, um, you guys are doing a multi-country comparison of a large database and that kind of like stresses other, um, uh, 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 other um, features of, of that comparison. Whereas we did a two-case uh, comparison of, you know, so, so kind of like the insights come from that contrast of, uh, of, of the two countries. And, and there's also an, an issue, right, around timing because um, in your case, uh, your data sets, sets stretch to 2014, which is kind of like um, the beginning of where, in our case, we start to see an unraveling of, of certain dynamics. Um, so I would leave it there for now, and again, happy to keep on talking about these issues later. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm responding to the, the question on kind of special benefits of, of having FCA in the, the Somali case and the, the secondment. Um, somehow I, I think that um, there was a long process before this request came that um, uh, at least in this case, the minister was clearly not shopping around, you know, asking for, uh, from different people and different actors for uh, um, support, but it was, a, it was very targeted. Um, and, and once again, um, complementing to the whole case that um, if our job is to, to uh, support the duty bearer, the government, or push them towards uh, human rights, push, push them uh, and support them towards accountability. And now we, we were in a, in a situation where there was a clear, clear accountability gap in the process that was uh, on paper it was perfect that now it's not the very weak um, uh, government with the very weak legitimacy but there was a plan to to have 135 of the elders of the clan representatives uh, making these crucial decisions on on uh, on parliament uh, for example um, and constitution uh, so um, Yes, it, it's, um, I, I would say that from uh, the minister's perspective, this was, uh, and from ours too, it was an uh, uh, action to, to add for the legitimacy, uh, whole credibility of the, the, the process that was there. Um, and I think there was an added value for FCA. It was a special for us, um, what we had done before. Um, and it, it, you know, the... It would have been difficult for me to think now that the, the request would have gone to other, other actors. It, it was so targeted. But then we, we come again to this, that is it replicable? Can, can this be done again? If, if it's such a, um, 
you know, delicate um, balance between different competences and history, organizational history and organizational mandates and funding. Again, MFA Finland here coming to, to, to support. Um, it's very fragile, the whole setting of uh, uh, doing such an operation and uh, it was successful this time.